Mr. James Ostridge, uh, my partner here at Federal Highway, and let him get let us let him give his update on the training and the uh, line of duty deaths, which is disturbing. But he'll he'll express that to you. <laughs> so, Jim. Thanks, Paul, and good afternoon to everyone. Good morning to to some. Um, uh, we're into 2020, and uh, I was going to say Happy New Year, but it's as far as uh, responder fatalities, struck by fatalities, uh, we're off to another uh, bad start, as you can see here with this uh, slide. Um, the folks over at uh, Respondersafety.com, Jack Sullivan, and the team uh, that have been um, working on tracking um, these these incidents um, are doing a great job and the you can see there obviously two firefighters two law enforcement officers and three towers uh, in the past uh, 22 days uh, I put the uh, URL for respondersafety.com of any of you uh, have never visited uh, we highly encourage that you do because they uh, they provide a tremendous service to the national team community as far as training, free training, as well as um, the tracking, our best attempt at tracking these uh, fatalities and injuries, um, near misses, et cetera. So uh, the call to action is obvious. Uh, I see, okay, I see, um, um, that we are uh, now, just to share as of the 13th, the national uh, statistics for the training. But I started to say the call to action for this, you know, as you're going through these slides, as well as all the other slides that Paul and I are going to present and throughout this whole webinar, but in particular, we need you to start thinking, you know, have, where, where are you with the program, the TIM training, your, your overall TIM program as well, not just the training, but certainly the training since it's the beginning of the year, and I'm going to hit on a couple uh, thoughts uh, with that. But anyway, as of 13, you can see, um, I like to say approaching 500,000, not, not as fast as some would like, including me. But I think it goes without saying the uh, remarkable work that's being done by all of you and many others that uh, don't have the opportunity to join us today. But uh, this is hugely important that we continue on this, this charge. Uh, and hopefully the numbers for line of duty deaths will, will uh, diminish greatly if not get to zero one day. Here are the traditional maps that we always share regarding the train the trainers. You hear me, uh, pardon me, you hear me mention all the time, and I know uh, that, that states are leading their own charge as, as far as train the trainers, refreshing the bench, and that's, again, one of the pieces that you need to be thinking about, who your trainers are, how much you're communicating with them, and how, and how, how, how often you're strategizing on how to achieve the numbers, the goal uh, that you'll see here in a minute as part of the SIT map. Here's the, uh, the total number of trainers. Won't belabor that. The web base as well as in-person training numbers. Uh, the web base in parentheses below. Uh, web based training continues to grow. And I can tell you the National Highway Institute, our training arm, as well as respondersafety.com is uh, very happy about that. So. Don't forget those responders way out there in those areas that can't get to an in-person course. Here's the total number trained by state. Here's the, the SIP map that I was referring to, a hugely important map for leadership and higher-ups, uh, all of us really. Um, and uh, happy to report now there are 21 states that are uh, uh, at 45% or above. So um, um, the goal, the, yeah, the 45 percent goal. So as I said, pat yourselves on the back. You should be very proud of this. But we need to accelerate this uh, and, and do a variety of other things uh, to uh, inform the public and uh, really get these uh, fatalities 
and injuries uh, under control. Here's the bar chart. Again, I'm not going to belabor this. Paul and I, we have a, a lot of great information about the summit and two great presentations coming up. Here regarding the goal, again, you can see the number of states in the middle there, 21. I, I would say if your state, and, and by the way, if you don't receive the national report um, uh, every two weeks from um, Paul and I from our office, uh, our contractor, once the, the report is generated, uh, we share it uh, with a variety of mostly leadership. But uh, we're going to apologize now uh, because we really uh, have been remiss in really not sharing it with the, the entire national team community. And that's something Paul and I are going to do here on the next round. So um, some of you may not, you know, just don't receive the report. And I think it's in important that you see the numbers. So here's why one slide before I end my presentation here as far as the training, and that is, again, what's your training plan for 2020? We have a huge opportunity right now to sit down. You as uh, state TIM training leaders and, and leaders of TIM programs vary, of varying shapes and sizes, uh, but um, ask yourselves, and honestly, ask yourselves where where you're at, again, I mentioned the trainers. Uh, do you need to refresh and you know your bench of trainers and and lead a, a, a train the trainer session and and maybe do that in collaboration with a neighboring state as a regional train the trainer things like that. Paul and I always uh, are pushing um, and and suggesting uh, that states do that because it's just a part of the business. When is your next team committee? Some of you do it on a regular basis, once quarterly, maybe twice a year. Some some may do it every month, and, and whether it's a statewide or a regional team committee, because Paul and I know that, and many of you too, that are that some states have you know six, seven, eight, ten different uh, small committees um, based on regions and just other configurations, and so. Uh, now's the time to sit down and discuss all these things. On, as far as the, the numbers, if you will, the you know it's a simple, what I believe <laughs> is a simple process, right? If you take the total number of of the population, the balance of your responder population that you need to train, just figure out how many classes you need to conduct a month, and uh, based on X number of students and and come to a consensus with your stakeholders um, and shoot for, for that number every month or every quarter, whatever the case may be. The stakeholders, we hear a lot of times that the stakeholders are engaged, but it's always the same one or two or three that, that are at the table. Uh, this is all a natural part of, of the business, um, but it behooves us as leaders to uh, keep the fire burning and going. And lastly, real quick, I, I, wanted, I wanted to mention the, the LTAPs, or the Local Technical Assistant Program offices, offices that exist, I believe, in most states in, uh, in conjunction or through Federal Highway, FHWA. There are a number of states like Ohio and Kentucky, uh, for example, that utilize their LTAPs and, um, for assistance with the training, for the tracking of the statistics and um, generating maps from our national SharePoint uh, site that shows where the responders are being trained in what counties or lack thereof and you know what counties etc so these are just some thoughts that uh, Paul and I wanted to share with you so with that I think um, well you know who we are and we're always there for you as best we can be so Paul Call Jim for us. Oh, I'm um, Good job, Jim. Thanks very much. Um, we um, we had a very exciting uh, event in November that um, uh, Jim and I, and especially our boss Mark Curley, was very hard to um, to put together with the, called the uh, Third Senior Transportation Summit. So we wanted to update you on the summit. We're going to try to move along fairly quickly because we have so much to to share with you. But first, by the numbers um, for the third public safety uh, summit, 
It was uh, definitely a, 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 um, a bigger, more ambitious, and faster-paced program. We put a lot of work into this. Uh, I can't tell you how many hours. Uh, we, we were there a day and a half. Um, we, uh, we had um, three modal administrators, uh, NHTSA, uh, FMCSA, and of course the Federal Highway Administrator all graciously participated. But the big special guest was the U.S. Uh, Secretary of Transportation, which is a big deal to us, just to get the Secretary of Transportation to come and speak at our event, uh, to focus on traffic incident management. She, she and those three modal administrators are very supportive of all the work that we're all doing together. So um, there was elected official there. There was a, a congressman we had to speak, and we'll talk about him in a minute. We have well, four elected officials, but there was a U.S. congressman there that did the lunch. Eight sessions, uh, 21 national associations, and we'll share a little bit more about that. We reached out to some new partners and um, 100, about 110 participants, uh, and um, and uh, with uh, and we concluded with the uh, um, the national um, the response awareness week uh, event uh, where Jim coordinated uh, all kinds of responders from. Um, from D.C. to come in, and we had a proclamation signing and uh, with responders in the back. But we'll share that with you in a few minutes. So, um, so you know, but before we get started, I wanted to share a little bit about the history of the summit. Um, one is the, um, in 2012, we had uh, an executive summit. I think there was about 35 people there. You can see, uh, um, you can see all high-level people. Uh, the, the Secretary of Transportation, um, LaHood, is in the middle there. But um, uh, I can tell you, I won't go through names. These are all senior people in all um, all the relative disciplines. So, um, so. Uh, some recommendations come out of that. Establish an executive leadership group, which we've maintained to this day. We uh, we still meet twice a year in person and, and talk on um, have a call in between each meeting. And um, we uh, deploy the national responder training. Of course, that was a big deal. Performance measures and legislation was discussed uh, extensively. Uh, the second summit was in January of 2015. We um, uh, the, the theme was institutionalization of Tim. We um, some of the highlights uh, conduct uh, Tim workshops and summits. We 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 didn't get around to doing the regional workshops. They were a good concept, and but we just um, we just didn't have the funding and the um, resources to do that. Um, the, uh, incorporate Tim into the strategic highway safety plans, and and we've seen an increase in those. Uh, create National Tim Response Awareness Week. We've done that. Jim's done a great job. We had a big big year this year that. Uh, I don't think we'll get to it today, but we'll have to share with you. I think we had, um, I don't know, 40 states or something. Uh, Jim has a better handle on that. Um, Tim testing tracks is a, at least three tracks that I know of that are going in. Pennsylvania, Tennessee has been established for a few few years now. and Measure secondary crashes and create a central repository for good practices. And, and we're working uh, with the, the Center of Excellence for that as well. So the third executive senior summit was it was held at the Navy Museum. Um, it's right next door to us. We we had to move our planned venue for USDOT headquarters over to next door to the Navy Yard, and um, uh, I think this is a very cool picture. These are all senior people. The Secretary of Transportation is in the middle there, and our our administrator and the th three other uh, two other modal administrators are there. Um, there is the state police colonel you can see up front, and um, and of course um, uh, I don't you know I don't want to start pointing out people to you, uh, but uh, just take my word these are all senior people within um, all the disciplines and all the organizations that we invited some some uh, as like Jim likes to put it non traditional partners, um, but uh, we like the pitches and um, we had uh, top uh, eight sessions. Um, uh, I won't read them all to you, but different sections focused on different on different um, opportunities to advance traffic incident management. I'm going to go over the first two and then share it off with Jim. Oh, we had a rapid fire session. These were our ELG members. We wanted them to to get up before the group because we had so many new members, um, so many new participants that we thought introducing the executive leadership group to 
to the rest of the community made a lot of sense. And um, and, and each given their own perspective, they each had a, um, called it a rapid fire session. They each had two or three minutes just to tell why they're here, why Tim's important, why it's important to their organization. And um, and so that's what we did, you know. So, um, okay. So these are the, these are just the, these are the, um, the different organizations that were that participated in that rapid fire session. Uh, the next one was uh, advancing Tim through Vision Zero, Road to Zero, and towards zero deaths. Who knew there were so many um, zero <laughs> deaths type uh, efforts? And there is. And um, but the you know the idea was zero fatalities, serious injuries. Uses on the roadway system, that sort of thing. So it it um, it was important to us to you know to to see if there's a place at the table for traffic incident management with these within these all these organizations. So um, we had um, uh, Jeff Lindley from the, from the ITE. He's a former Federal Highway Associate Administrator for Operations. He used to be our boss. Uh, Everett Lott from um, the district, uh, the, 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 department, um, the D.C. District uh, Department of Transportation Deputy Director, talk about the, mod the modal uh, national, the, the, the safety initiatives that they're using, usually at the local level, more at the local versus statewide level on the, um, on the, the, um, the, the toward zero deaths. Uh, Mike Tula, Director of Montana DOT and AASHTO Committee on Safety Chair, spoke towards zero deaths, which is an ASHTO-led effort, and, um, and then uh, Jane Turney from the National Safety Council spoke about Road to Zero by doubling down on what works and ac accelerating and prioritizing. So, um, but in the middle of all that, sorry, this, so, you know, so as we create, you know, in the middle of all this design, policy, culture is in operations is the, is is Tim. So, but um, you know the traditional approach versus the Vision Zero approach, and um, but we you know we we have reached out to some of these organizations before, and they all expressed interest. And um, but now we think there's an opportunity to actually play, and for them to understand that you know that our world can help with their vision towards zero deaths. So the next session was on the responder training, and I'm going to let Jim take it from here. Okay, Paul. And, and just to piggyback on what you were saying, the non-traditional organizations that we had the honor to, to um, uh, collaborate with prior to the summit, uh, our office director, Mark Curley, and Paul and I, um, through the suggestions of the executive leadership group, actually, um, for the past couple of years, had had suggested to us that, you know, especially if we wanted to reach the the more local level responder community, um, that these organizations such as the National League of Cities, the National Governors Association, AAA, and and many others, AMBA, et cetera, um, uh, that this was the way to do it. So uh, as far as accelerating the training, you heard me say during my, you know, uh, national report, uh, one of the things uh, that we continue to work on is uh, through the uh, credit, uh, Commission on Accreditation for Pre-Hospital Continued Education, CAPSI, as well as Everyone Goes Home, uh, uh, the International Association of Directors of Law Enforcement Standards and Training, uh, uh, IATALYS, for law enforcement. The, the momentum that we have, and this is, again, for you guys to discuss during your meetings, you know, a lot of you have already engaged your local uh, state uh, police and fire academies. That's a biggie. That's a, 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 a real big uh, and important part of institutionalization, and we encourage you to do that. We'd be delighted to help you to do that if you're a little hesitant. But anything and everything, um, uh, that that you can do as a team to grow the numbers in your state uh, is gonna is gonna make a difference. It's it's gonna not just reduce the congestion, but it's gonna reduce fatalities and injuries. Think about the 
you know, there's periods of time, I can't help but think a lot of times, where, you know, oh, an area doesn't have any fatalities involving, you know, uh, crashes or, or just crashes, you know, to say nothing of the responders that, that get killed due to the D drivers, as we call them, right? Um, so there, there is the potential, there is a possibility that, that one day we get to that zero that you just heard Paul mention on all these these initiatives that are out there to do that truthfully. So um, besides, um, uh, for example, Kentucky and Georgia uh, have recently over the past year and a half, two years, mandated the training, the TIM training for the EMS personnel in those states. Have you, have you done that? Are you in the process of doing that? Um, we, we often share and have many times, and, and sorry to be repetitive, but we're, we're, we constantly are repeating these things so that, that you take it to heart and, 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 and take action to work with your state police highway patrols to, to stroke a letter like Colonel Trott did in, from Tennessee and Colonel Flaherty, and uh, I apologize, forget the colonel, the other colonels in Kentucky and the other states, but you know, requiring the towers to to uh, take TIM training before they're eligible to participate in this in the contract towing, um, uh, you know, contracts uh, for towers, uh, and the the training. Um, well, you see this number. We're fifteen thousand plus over this number down here at the bottom. So, um, as we continue on, Paul, very dear to Paul, and my heart is uh, the data piece. Um, Paul's led a few initiatives uh, with the EDC uh, uh, 4 uh, for the collection of data, and now on EDC 5 with crowdsourcing. Um, and, uh, and not just, you know, the, the use, the proper use. Some of you may not have engineers and, and, and personnel that can use this data because we always say the data is there. There's a lot of data, TMC data, the DOTs have and others have, but they they don't use it to to their benefit to make the case. There are some states that are, but I know Paul talks a lot about that um, in his uh, travels and um, think about that uh, as much as you can. Do you, are you are you using the data right? Um, the technologies that are out there with UAS and and uh, other other systems, you know, the 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 environment in a traffic management system today is a much more high tech, much more demanding environment where our, our control room operators are going to have to be really uh, much more educated, if you will, much more in tune to to uh, using these systems uh, for congestion and crash uh, traffic incident management. Um, and these, um, these systems, obviously, uh, with the advent uh, as far as uh, automated connected vehicles uh, as well. But the main point there is making the case for Tim, using that data for making the case for Tim. Won't belabor this. Uh, again, but these non-traditional partnerships, Paul and I, were, were two months out from the, from the summit, <clears throat> and we've made some progress as the National League of Cities, uh, with them including a, a one-page newsletter to all their state members, chapters, if you will. As Paul said earlier, we're going to be going to the AM, AMBA, American Association of Motor Vehicles, uh, down in Orlando and Florida to do a presentation. Uh, and uh, uh, these other organizations that participated uh, have committed to working with us. We just need to to uh, to grow the program, grow this movement to where uh, everybody, in particular the the public, the motoring public, that in a lot of states, 71 percent are unaware of their slow down move over laws. Uh, Linda Andra from uh, Tucumcari, New Mexico, a uh, great friend and partner of the program, also owns a large towing company at, down there, lost her son uh, a couple of years ago, and, and trailblaze in the state of New Mexico to stand up Bobby's Law, uh, which today exists uh, thanks to, to Linda and 
Linda is a, a wonderful person and someone that, well, it proves what, what I've said. I know I've said before, one person can, can make a difference. You just have to, you know, think, you know, and get out there and, and partner with, with your friends and, and, and uh, associates, uh, or you can go it alone if you feel, you know, compelled. But the authority removal laws, driver removal laws, there's a whole variety of differences from state to state. But uh, again, the distracted, drunk, drowsy, and drug drivers, disabled drivers, you know, they're out there and they're, they're a tough bunch to uh, protect against. So you must never, uh, must never take your eyes off traffic. And I'm running behind here, I'm let me, sorry. Let me, just, let me just jump in Please. for a second. I know we are behind a little bit, but you know, that Linda Unruh, for those of you that have conferences and looking for a motivational speaker, she gave the best speaker of the whole conference the best talk of the whole conference. Very emotional. She lost her son. Um, she is on a mission. She changed the move over law. Um, it's a very, very impressive story. In fact, we might try to feature her on a talk at Tim webinar soon. But um, if you're looking for a motivational speaker, s similar to the sergeant, um, Sergeant that come out of Pennsylvania that gives a very motivational speech about he talk about his history, um, but I just wanted to mention that, Jim. So, yeah, Ooh. Paul, good, good, good catch. And that was Sergeant Bob Beavis from Bob Beavis, Pennsylvania, yeah. who also presented, and his life was changed forever um, during an incident. But uh, Linda, to Paul's point, Linda, just an incredible speaker and and just powerful presentation. She's actually working with AAA, and the Tone Recovery Association of America is going to support her as well. Uh, but AAA, she's going to be uh, visiting a number of states to give presentations. Uh, that was a good, uh, good catch, Paul. So I won't belabor this. Talked already a little bit about it. The um, um, uh, improving Tim through technology. Uh, any, uh, many of you, or I, I hope, I suspect, attended the recent Transportation Research Board (TRB) annual meeting in Washington just a week ago. And for example, there, there's a lot happening and a lot more to come on the the relationship with automated and connected vehicles and their response community. So stay tuned. Excuse me. Stay tuned for that. And uh, but our, our Tahoe uh, that's equipped with a police package was on the floor of the convention center at TRB, and we had it communicating with the sing signal uh, to demonstrate uh, priority signal prioritization um, for response vehicles. It's a big deal. There's a there's a lot happening in that area. Uh, of course, we've heard Paul mention the and and promulgate you know computer aided dispatch crowdsourcing. Ways and all the other uh, technologies, as well as UAS. A lot more to come on that. Paul, do you want to add anything? No, no, no. That's uh, no. That I think that's good enough. Is that we're going to be working in all of these areas. Um, Jim and I are going to be trying to coordinate activities and leading some, inf you know, inf information on all of these. So, want to come on that. But the session was very good with a lot of with a lot of pretty impressive people. Indeed, indeed. So. Um, Paul mentioned the National Traffic Incident Response Awareness Week. It's a part of our our lives and our community every year, the second week in November. Uh, you see Paul and Mark Curley and, and some of us around the uh, proclamation. Uh, and this is a big deal. Um, as Paul said, we were honored by the secretary and these administrators from NHTSA and FN, FNCSA. And the high levels that Paul mentioned a couple times from all the major organizations are behind you, are behind us. And let's see. Not sure what happened there. Not sure, Adam, if did I lose the uh, slides? I just forwarded for you, Jim. Okay, thanks. So again, this, uh, you know, a few of these are repetitive, um, but as I asked you early on, you, 
please think of this. We we know, we understand how busy everyone is. Uh, that's okay, Paul. Um, it's 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 just that we're in this. You know, we're in this together. We know that you're committed as 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 Federal Highway is, and and even, it's a motor carrier, but it behooves us as leaders to take this to the next level. Part of the intent of the summit, the third summit, um, was to not only engage the new partners, new organizations, uh, but to, to remind everybody of the importance of, you know, why, why we're in this, why Tim is important. And uh, always remember, that could be your family member, your uncle that's a firefighter, your brother who's a who's a police officer, a tow or a service patrol. Um, so let's see. The goals, summary of the salt goals. Paul, you want to? Yeah, I can take it. I can take it. Take it. So, um, yeah, we, you know, we just a few more slides, folks, and it was a lot, a lot here. We were so very excited about the summit, and so wasn't a lot of other people. But we wanted to renew the the focus of Tim across uh, agency leadership at higher level about our agency and others. They were all senior people, and I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, fire chiefs, police colonels, and uh, DOT uh, leadership and, and things like that. So, um, but we wanted to invite new partners. We wanted to engage new partners, and then we wanted to introduce new new opportunities to move forward uh, with technology policy and um, uh, Adam. It's not moving. Yeah. Yet. And Paul, I just want to say uh, again, similarly, not just your traditional. Uh, response agencies, uh, partners, stakeholders, but these same organizations that we mentioned earlier, um, have you ever engaged them in your state? They they may not, you know, all have local offices in your state, uh, but you never know. And uh, sometimes all it takes is picking up the phone. Adam, I'm I'm stuck. There you go. Did you get it, Paul? Yeah, I think Adam's moving them for me because I'm I'm frozen here too. Uh, so you know the big recommendations were recommit to the one million goal. Um, uh, you know the, uh, there's a tremendous so that you know that that we talked about CAPSI and I Analyst and uh, you know that you know the, these these accreditation agencies that you know that can, can contribute to the um, continuing ed credits. But the big deal to me is the next opportunity is the, is the, the, the you know the different the, the new elected officials the National League of Cities the Association of Counties the National Governors Association ITE um, that's the that's the to me the next the next challenge and Jim and I will be focusing a lot more on local agencies coming and moving forward and those were the recommendations that came out of it but that was sort of our thinking in the beginning anyway so Adam. Um, I, again, Go ahead, Paul. performance measures, I won't talk about the performance measures again, the technology, we already talked about that, but these were, you know, f fund uh, research, those are the, these are recommendations not by Jim and I and Mark, these were rec recommended by the participants in the group during the discussion, so, next one, one more, I think. <laughs> um, so we, yeah, we, we, um, yeah, that that slide there. So we've had already had starting to get some progress. The National League of Cities has, has reached out to their state partners and recommending Tim sessions um, as an opportunity when they held hold their statewide conferences. So you may hear something from us to see if you can assist with with that. Um, that would be cool. Um, there was outreach through the ITE. Um, uh, Public Agency Council, the executive, their executive committee. Jim's doing a presentation at AMVA, and um, and then that we we are going to be likely going to be expanding the executive leadership group. So next, well, a few of the new partners, three, two to four of the new part people that we have identified. Um, so we ask you to participate. This is the day two. Um, um, we ask you to. See what you can do about maybe in, and doing the same. Try to engage some of the, your new partners, uh, the new new organizations. What opportunities might might be there for you? I I think we should move on, Adam. And um, 
that picture there, this next picture is just the, the people from day two that were there. Um, um, Jim is not in that picture because he was outside fighting with security about all the motorcycles and vehicles and all kinds of service patrol vehicles that he had on our um, uh, on a, um, a spot that we had designated for the for the event that we had. With that, I think that should be the last slide, Adam. So we'll go on to Sean, who's going to talk to us about the um, you know Florida is one of the best programs in the country and. Um, uh, they're always doing uh, cutting edge stuff, and this is um, and this is even more using the data near and dear to my heart. Someone is actually not even not only collecting the data, but has plans to use the data, and this is Sean's plan. Sean, uh, thank you for the the generous introduction, there, Paul. Um, I will try to live up to uh, <laughs> to that bar. Um, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, today as part of the webinar. Um, data is uh, the key to a lot of the victories and the lack of data sometimes is also uh, key to some defeats that we have within the program. Um, but one of the things that I've learned in my brief time in the industry is that um, the people that tell the best story about what they're doing and how they're doing it are the ones that tend to have the greatest success, uh, both in the operational realm and with getting funding. Um, because a lot of times the people that we deal with uh, in our leadership are familiar with what we're doing, but they're not down in the weeds, uh, in the trenches, uh, on the day-to-day -day stuff. So the better job that we do in telling and informing our leadership of what, how we're um, performing and executing the, the task of traffic incident management, the better off we are. Uh, one of the documents, in fact, uh, the prime document that uh, we've always dealt with historically is the open roads policy. Um, we're not the only state that has one. Um, there are several around the country that do, uh, but really it helps as a basis between uh, Florida DOT and Florida Highway Patrol in how we approach incidents uh, and how we keep the roads open, uh, kind of delineate some of those duties and responsibilities uh, to one or the other, and it really gives us an understanding that um, it's a partnership. It's not just DOT telling uh, Florida Highway Patrol how to handle their business or the other way around, um, which really, really helps when we're talking about how we approach um, opening the lanes uh, to our state highway system. i give a little more background. Uh, we signed our original agreement in 2002. Um, it was revised again in 2014. Obviously, some things have changed since um, it was first signed. Um, but the year that it was revised, um, we went into our SunGuide uh, archive. We found about you know 1,800 or so um, incidents that were in SunGuide that met the characteristics of an open roads policy event. Um, of those incidents, about 92% um, met or ex or came in under that 90-minute. Uh, threshold established by the open roads policy. Um, the ones that did meet or come in under that time, on average, were about 18 to 19 minutes. Um, so we've done really well at um, identifying the incidents and getting an idea of what they are. Uh, we dig further into the data. We can kind of isolate what types of events are included in those. Um, we know that we have outliers. Uh, one of the things that we're doing now is we're looking at those events that are extremely long in duration that don't fit the typical mold of incidents, if there is such a thing, so we can better understand why those times were skewed. Um, that will help us as we move forward because 
if we understand the types of events that are causing us not to meet open roads policy time, we can dig in, study it, and find out maybe there's a unique solution that we need to implement for certain type of incidents versus the standard one, again, if there is one. Um, so we look at other states with open roads policies. Um, here's a list of them. Interestingly enough, uh, some don't have uh, established criteria for that initial traffic control after the notification, um, but they're sticking well within what other states are doing for open roads policy. I think the only one is Nevada, and they've got a 120-minute open roads policy clearance time. But, you know, the key when we're looking at something like this is to understand that based on the data, how it's being collected, where it's being collected for, um, all states aren't going to be the same. Uh, you've got some states that are mostly rural. You've got some that are metropolis. You know, you've got the uh, large cities that are urbanized. All of those are going to have different numbers, and they're going to have different demographics, different vehicle traffic, um, whether it be trucks or regular vehicles. But the one thing we always come back to is everybody kind of uses that same, you know, 90 to 120 minute. Here are the states. We talked about open roads policies uh, among several states. We talked about the clearance time goals. Um, so let's look at just some examples of, of how clearance times and open roads policy kind of work together or in concert. Uh, in July 2019, uh, FHP um, investigate about 15,000 crashes um, involving about 20, 29,000 vehicles. Um, and as you can see there, you know, about 7,700 required towing. Uh, a lot of times, in fact, with the crashes, uh, tow trucks are not dispatched uh, immediately. They wait for um, an FHP officer to arrive, evaluate the scene, kind of size it up before they request uh, tow trucks. Uh, which, you know, in and of itself, that's if that's how they choose to do their, their business, I mean, that's their way of, of doing that. Um, we've floated several ideas uh, in as our relationship with FHP to uh, consider the possibility of, say, like an instant dispatch tow. Um, so while the trooper is en route to the accident scene, a tow truck could be en route as well. Um, and they could possibly arrive at the same time, or in some cases your, your tow vehicle could be there before FHP, just standing by until they get to go ahead to move a vehicle. Um, just one of those things that could be included in future versions of an open roads policy. Um, but we're looking at the data and we see that there is an effect. In fact, that last bullet talks about approximately 123 hours of cumulative response time to crashes on interstates um, due to waiting for law enforcement to arrive. Um, but we also want to keep in mind, too, that open roads policy um, is a living, breathing document that it's not we write it once and it's that, that the way it is forever and ever, amen. Uh, we need to look at it from time to time and reevaluate. So as we use data, the better data sets that we have, we can look at how the operational piece is taking place on the side of the road, marry that up with data that we have in our system, and we can run um, a comparison or a correlation uh, between the two and say, okay, if we change some things on the side of the road, what could we expect in the open roads policy clearance times? Um, and data is the best way to do that. So this chart has uh, got the last 10 years of SunGuide data in it. Um, and you can see as we progress from fiscal year 10 uh, on up through fiscal year 2019, those events don't go down. 
there are more cars on the road, there are more roadways being instrumented and uh, data being collected for. And using SunGuide, um, our software, we can sort through and do a lot of evaluation. And that, that fourth column from the left, percentage of 90 minutes or under, uh, gives us an idea of how well or how poorly we're doing with that 90-minute uh, clearance time. And we're going to come to that here in, in just a couple of minutes of how the, what we're using that relative position for. So when you look at SunGuide data, our, uh, our information technology specialists are able to go through that data and say, okay, 92% for this past fiscal year of our uh, open roads policy incidents were done in 90 minutes or less. Um, 75 minutes, 89% of our um, incidents were cleared in 90 minutes or less that met open roads policy requirements. And if you look at that line taper off, you see if you look down at that bottom uh, border for the numbers, 75%, I'm sorry, 89% were done in 75 minutes or less. 60 minutes, 84% or less. And the reason why this is important is if the goal never changes, um, we'll always meet it. Uh, or at least 90, 92% of the time. If we want to stretch our program, if we want to make vast improvements, we have to look at where we're at. Could we do better? And those are kind of like the four or five questions that I ask myself when we talk about data is uh, we have several stretches of roadway where we um, implemented freeway service patrol uh, I-75 between the north end of the turnpike and the state line. We did it on I-95 um, from, say, like St. Lucie on up to St. John's. Places that didn't have freeway service patrol operations before, and we implemented them over the last 12 to 18 months. So using data, we go back and say, okay, what was the situation before we put the patrol on the road? Then you come back after they've been on the road for a few months to a year. What was the change? Was there a change? So first, did you make a difference? Two, how much of a difference did you make? Uh, and I think the third question will be, was that good? And the only way we know if that change or that uh, difference was good or not is to look around to the other programs uh, of similar demographic, tra vehicle traffic, and vehicle types and do a comparison. Well, you can't compare if you don't have the data to compare with. And that's where we're using that data. We'd like, I would be welcome to uh, coordinate with any state that's collecting the same types of data and maybe establish a, a standard, if you will, or maybe a, a goal uh, that we could shoot for. Because we've been hitting 90 minutes pretty majority of the time for the last 10 years. Um, I think that would be the next step would be to possibly look at a new goal and shoot for a new goal. Um, Another area that we compare our, um, our sun guide data in is rapid incident scene clearance. Those specialty um, incidents that exceed the normal rotational record uh, capabilities. Uh, since fiscal year 14, we've increased from 125 to 314 um, incidents per year, which is, yeah, that's almost a 300% increase um, in the numbers, and it's only going to get higher as we get more vehicles on the road. Our sun guide and our IT information uh, gurus can take this data and tell that story, so if we need to go back to leadership and ask for more funding, that we could approach them with facts and make a legitimate request for more funding. Um, 
here we look at in total incentives paid for uh, the fiscal year 19 is roughly about $630,000. Um, I feel very confident that with the data that we've accumulated and the way that we tell our story, that we could probably get some more money for that. Um, exactly how much, I mean, a detailed study would reveal that, but I'm pretty confident that we could go back and request additional funding for that program. Of our specialty events or our risk events, uh, how they stack up in the open roads policy, uh, you can see the graph there. I mean, we fluctuate between 86 and 97 percent of the time uh, across the state of meeting the open roads policy on our specialty incidents. So what it boils down to in conclusion is sharing information between response agencies, being able to articulate our current status and if there's room for improvement, and being able to um, tell that story to leadership in a way that gets buy-in and commitment to uh, give more funding, more resources, uh, maybe more personnel to approach the, the need, and maybe change our goals, um, maybe elevate the, the game statewide. This time, does anyone have any questions about what I've mentioned, what I've uh, what I've proposed, or any of the data? John, why don't we? Um, Terry has a question in the chat pod, but in the interest of time, we we started late. We lost some time in the middle there. Uh, it looks like we're not going to have time for questions. Um, not only at <laughs> probably not at the end, because Todd's got a very good presentation too uh, that may may be lengthy. So if you don't mind. Um, I, I really like the fact that um, you know we're establishing goals based on data and type of incident. Um, that's where the nation is going. That's tremendous. You guys are leading the nation on that. I really um, appreciate the work you guys are doing. And, and again, trend setting because I've been speaking to that for a long time. I, um, that you know, to a 90-minute in incident. It should only take 30 minutes is, <laughs> is not a very good goal. So, Todd, um, we're going to take it from this. So, I, I, you know, we crunched. We're going to crunch you with with time. I think. I wonder if we should save that video for the next talk at Tim webinar. But it's up to you. Um, but uh, the floor is yours, sir. Yeah, I think we'll keep the video in. I'll I'll just try to make it quick. A lot of these slides are going to be just pass through slides, and and we'll go on. Um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I want to talk about what we're doing here in Pennsylvania. Uh, with our Pen Time program, which is a statewide traffic incident management program, and, and show you a few things that we're working on and trying to get training out to everybody. Everything uh, that everybody talked about, what Jim, what Paul, and what Sean talked about is partnerships. So uh, that's what we're doing. I just wanted to give you our strategic plan. My full-time uh, paid job is my for the Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission as a traffic incident management coordinator. So I cover all 552 miles of roadway uh, for the Turnpike Commission. This gives you a an idea of what we cover. We cover 110 miles of northeast extension, 359 miles east and west, and then we have some western extensions of the turnpike again. Uh, 552 total miles and about 2,400 total lane miles. So uh, it's a 24-7, 365 operation. The photo there, the uh, the gentleman on the upper right photo, that's Chester. He just retired last fall with 63 years uh, at the Pennsylvania Turnpike when he retired. If I had to be 63 years, somebody needs to come up and and uh, smack me around and tell me to go home. Uh, I won't last that long. Years. Holy moly. Okay. So, you know, our, our partners, again, part, part of my job, we do things a little bit differently here at the Pennsylvania Turnpike, so we have partners. Uh, Pennsylvania Troop T is 100% paid for by the Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission, so the, they are Pennsylvania State Police Troopers, their cars, their barracks, everything about them are paid for by the Pennsylvania Turnpike. We also contract with 22 contracted towing companies, our towers are first responders. They get dispatched immediately upon receipt of an accident. We don't wait to, to verify. Uh, we send them out. Uh, we also have 110 fire companies and 67 ambulances. They get $1,000 a year. They're volunteer companies, but we pay them to respond on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. They're not getting rich to respond out there, but they're our partners, so we pay them a little bit of, 
of money and a little bit of a stipend to respond. Uh, Adam, if you want to share the video, I'll uh, explain what this video is. So one of the things we want to do is to make sure that uh, we share the message about why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, and the number one thing that we're trying to get across is uh, we give the number a lot of times of how many responder deaths have occurred. Right now there's you know, there's 49 responder deaths last year, there's seven this year. So I created this video and we shared doing our training and, and uh, available for anybody that wants this this uh, this video because I don't want to just give the numbers. I want people to see the faces of uh, who has been killed. So go ahead, Adam. So if this doesn't play right, we could also share the link out with everybody. But these are the responders that have been killed in 2019 and 2020 so far. Again, you know, these are your your uh, fathers, mothers, sisters, brothers, all the responders that have been killed. I work with Jack Sullivan and Angela Roper from RespondersSafety.com that we track these responders that have been killed. So these are the, uh, the people. The ones that the assets are not typically line of duty deaths, but they were doing what they were uh, they would do if they were on duty as well. Adam, it doesn't seem like this is going to play very well. So we I, we could just share the link out later on, and then that way I'll keep moving. Uh, again, I will sh share that link. It's it, it's a majestic video. Uh, again, these are the responders then in Pennsylvania that have been struck and killed. So again, there's a hundred, uh, there's 150 responders that we have listed. But so far, you know, between the turnpike, there's 279 emergency responders that have been struck and killed between the turnpike workers. Another thing that I do is I've made up a Google map that I, I plot these out and I show people where in Pennsylvania these responder deaths occurred uh, by discipline. So orange are Pennsylvania turnpike workers, yellow is PennDOT workers. You know, you have the blue policeman badge. And we want to show that these incidents happen all over uh, Pennsylvania and all, I'm sure all over each of your jurisdictions as well. This is a Google map, so if you click on each of those icons, it will bring up the information about that crash, so it ha would have their names as well. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll make sure that everybody gets the video, or I'll share it with Adam, that we can maybe share that video out. If you haven't heard of Respondersafety.com, make sure you check it out. It's free, high-quality online training. Uh, there is a copy of this uh, handout that's in the downloads that are available that you can download this information as well to get that. And this tells you what training is on respondersafety.com. If you have a, a traffic operation center, we're just coming out with a new module uh, that we just previewed. It. I just previewed it and took the class over the weekend that that will be available as well uh, for everybody. These are some of the struck by incidents. So make sure that if you're trying to sell this, tell the tale, in your area that you point out some of these incidents. This was a bright sunny Tuesday day where this uh, fire apparatus squad 33 was struck on the turnpike. $33,000 damage there, but at least you no know, responders were killed or injured because the, the uh, vehicle did its job. The driver of that minivan was uh, a over-the-road truck driver that was coming home after a long day, fell asleep, and hit the, hit the side of the apparatus because it was blocking. This is another one that occurred January of last year. The Tower got dispatched to the scene, arrived on the scene two minutes after the crash was reported, started removing the vehicle. Luckily, he was paying attention, and that vehicle went up over his head uh, and just missed hitting him. Again, we want to make sure we tell tell the story here. We talk about secondary crashes. Make sure that you're trying to get the message out about secondary crashes as well. I have two secondary crashes that are videos that are in the downloads from Todd there, the dash cam footage of the crash and also the PA turnpike crash. Those are all examples of secondary crashes. We, we, those are dash cam footage. A lot of times people tell us, you know, why don't you shut down the highway? Why don't you shut down the roadway? Make it safer. You know, those videos are examples of why we don't need to do that. For every minute uh, on the scene, you increase the chance of a secondary crash by 2.8%. 
again, these are the videos that are, are there in the, the downloads. Of, uh, feel free to download them if you have any questions. This, uh, this first video is the dash cam footage of the crash that killed uh, three people. Uh, this is a truck driver dash cam as, as he's crashing into the, the vehicle. A two-year-old little girl, her 28-year-old father, and a 53-year-old female were killed in this crash. Uh, this, this second crash is the one that's on the screen here. I'm about two-tenths of a mile in front of this, this accident when this occurred here. Uh, the gentleman that's driving the, the vehicle with the dash cam, he was going to the meeting that I was going to uh, when this crash occurred. Uh, a five-year-old little girl was killed in this crash, so I show this, again, as an example of why we need to do traffic incident management and get there. Uh, safe, efficient clearance, again, communications, coordination, and cooperation, make sure that everybody's on the same page. Uh, we're increasing our training, we're increasing our situational awareness, we meet with our responders, and we develop joint operational policies and procedures. So in Pennsylvania, we have a fairly recent uh, traffic incident management program in the state. We call it Penn Time. Uh, our Pennsylvania Traffic Incident Management Enhancement Program uh, so that we are, are trying to make sure that we are all working together for traffic incident management. It's state agencies, it's local MPOs, DVRPC, uh, Chris King's on, uh, I believe, on the uh, call. Uh, we also deal with the Southwestern Planning, our Pennsylvania Commission in the western part of the state, and some local partners as well. Uh, we met in 2016 to begin forming. Uh, we talked about the importance of TIM. And we came up with some ideas. And these are the priority action items we did. You know, we want to establish the program. We have an executive statewide panel. Those are the queen bees. Those are the people that make the decision that could spend the money. But those aren't the people doing traffic incident management day in and day out. We also want to make sure that we enhance and have joint training activities, increase driver uh, education and outreach. So again, this is our structure here. Uh, and we have some joint operational policy, and we have a joint interagency agreement to talk about traffic incident and management in Pennsylvania. And any of these documents, again, could be available if anybody wants anything. So program advancements in the, in the three years since Penn Time, we've done uh, 251 training classes and trained over 6,000 emergency responders uh, in, in, the, in the classroom. So we're doing a lot more training. Uh, We've also conducted 11 train, trainer classes to get 161 more trainers available. And we developed a online version of, of the SHARP-2 program since January of last year, so we're a little bit over a year into the online program. And we trained 3,600 people online, which is an awesome number. And I never thought we'd have that many in the first year. Uh, but we'll tell you how we do that. We facilitate the uh, formation and growth of the new TIM task forces. Or we're working on Unified Incident Command. I don't know if any of you teach a Unified Incident Command program, but uh, we are revamping that, and we will share any of that information out as well uh, with anybody. Also looking at automated vehicles. We're testing 100 automated vehicles in Pennsylvania right now, level three and level four, uh, with uh, six different companies. So we're developing an automa automated vehicle incident response plan that we hope to have out later this year that we're willing to share uh, with anybody that's interested as well. Uh, we want our responders to know where the technology is, how to disable those vehicles so they don't run over anybody. Uh, Jim mentioned earlier we are still moving forward with building a statewide traffic incident management training facility. It's a $32 million facility called Penn Start uh, so that we uh, are going to train emergency responders to work together on highways and under real world environment. So training, where are we at? We talked about the uh, online e-learning course. Uh, this was a course that was developed uh, by one of uh, the guys I work with from Drive Engineering, Dave Wolf. He does a great job, he, uh, a, a great partner, uh, to help us push this training out. This was a, a, a uh, joint effort of the Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission, PennDOT, and the State Fire Commissioner's Office. In the first year, again, uh, these are the numbers through December, trained over 3,600 people in traffic incident management using the online version. It's an interactive course. It requires knowledge check after each lesson. If you don't get at least an 80% on the knowledge check, you can't move on. Uh, so we want to make sure that people actually learn and, and look at and understand what they're going through. This is just a map. We, we produce a, a report each month, a performance report, showing you where the training has taken place and uh, what counties in Pennsylvania. So right now we only have three counties that we have not had anybody complete the training in, uh, but we're working to get somebody to uh, – complete that training. If I have to, I'm going to drive up there, take the class just so we could get those counties counted as well. Uh, 
what we did, we also reached out to the Philadelphia City of Philadelphia Fire Department. I walk, work with uh, Commissioner Thiel. Uh, they now mandated traffic engine management training for all 2,000 members of the Philadelphia Fire Department, uh, which is great. Everybody from uh, Adam, the who's the commissioner, on down to the administrative assistants are required to take this training, and, and they have taken this training. So that's great that they are getting an understanding. Out of them uh, doing the training where they took this, we probably had out of uh, uh, one to five star reviews, uh, we had over 90% saying that, yes, this training was necessary. Yes, they learned something from taking the training. So that was great to hear. Uh, we also did 40 in-person training classes for the City of Pittsburgh Fire Department. So that was uh, a PennDOT and a Southwestern Planning Commission effort to get them to uh, take this training, but we did 40 classes in 20 days. We trained 650, all 650 firefighters and EMTs for the City of Pittsburgh Fire Department. In addition, uh, they updated all the traffic cones on all their apparatus, updated all their high-vis vests on all their apparatus, and they are very proud that they completed this traffic incident management training program. In fact, uh, when they actually go out there and they do something on the streets, they're able to send us some information and send us some photos saying, look, you know, we we get it. We learned. Uh, we're doing a good job in this. So that was great. Uh, hey, this also I, led to. Can I, can I interrupt you for a second? Yes, sir. So um, the big cities are our, our biggest challenge, if you will. Um, you know, we. You know, so. Um, you know, when when you see the, when you can connect with the big cities, that that is what um, that is what is going to help us move forward, move the numbers forward. And just as Todd just explained, you know, to all of you, once they see it, they like it. <laughs> you know, once they, you know, and, and this has been the case since the day one on the, on the National Responder Training Program is once the firefighters see it, they say, yep, this makes sense. So I just want to emphasize the importance of reaching out to those big cities uh, and the success Todd has had. So um, sorry for, to interrupt, yeah. Todd. It, it's an important no, point no. I, I really wanted to make there. Thank you. You know, what was great about that too is is you know we yeah you know, we had that communication that we had those partnerships with some of these and we invited them to be part of our pen time effort so they understood what we were trying to do and you know I share regular emails with them and share the information with them and share the program with them uh, that program our e learning program also won our ITS Pennsylvania uh, project of the year uh, because it was a cooperative effort and for the number of responders and, and transportation professionals that we train. So our thinking is that we get the big city fire departments to agree to take Tim training. Hey, I pimped that out on social media, and I let everybody know, like, hey, city of Philadelphia fire department's taking this. Why aren't you taking it? Exactly. And I've done that. Perfect. Get yeah. some of the other fire departments to, you know, I've sent the, I got permission from uh, Adam and from the Philadelphia fire department. I said, look, can I send your general order that you wrote to these other city fire departments and say, look, if it's good enough for these guys, why aren't you taking it? And they've, they've taken that general order, you know, changed the names around, changed the names of the department around, issued the same general order to their first now. So I'm easily, uh, I'm not sure what our numbers are going to be for January. You know, we only pull the numbers usually once a month uh, to bring them in. But based on the numbers that I'm seeing for this month of the reviews that I have coming in, I think so far today from the uh, time that I got up this morning and, and went to work at six o'clock till now, I probably we probably got another 150 reviews for the program. You know, so people are taking the course; they're they're out there and they're getting that training. So you know, we want to make sure that that that's out there. Uh, John, I see you know you had there for for a city fire department taking it for the rookie school school and, and expanded to the veterans. That's very good. You know, we need to make sure that everybody gets it. The veterans, especially, because again, they're the old. Uh, I know I've been involved in the fire service since 1982. You know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks a lot of times. But again, once they take this class and once they see what you're trying to do, I think it, it definitely uh, makes a difference for them. Some of the other additional fire departments that we're looking to train and that we have trained, you know, City of Harrisburg is doing the online course. Uh, Scranton and uh, City of Chester fire departments, we did multiple classes for them that we did uh, in-person classes, and again. Uh, you know, these aren't necessarily departments that run along the Pennsylvania Turnpike, but they're part of our Penn Time program, and we need to get them trained. And if I could show a volunteer company in the area that, hey, these paid guys are taking this training, it sort of makes it easier for them to say, yeah, if it's important for them, it's important for us too. So uh, that's why we do a lot of that 
as well. I see Terry, you said, how are you funding the training? Right now, I, I teach a lot of times for free uh, and also the, the, the training. So we have uh, some uh, LTAP money that, that some of the in-class training is provided through that, uh, through a, a, an arrangement we have with our Township Supervisors Association. Uh, I teach a lot on uh, both uh, doing my turnpike time for some of our providers, but I teach a lot on nights and weekends uh, for absolutely free just to get the training out there to everybody. Um, as well. In the, I think in the past uh, two years I've taught uh, about 150 in-classroom uh, training sessions. I have two scheduled this weekend. I think I have nine more scheduled before the end of February. We recently just trained the Pennsylvania State Police again. Yeah, Pennsylvania State Police, every one of the people were supposed to have traffic and management training. Uh, we wanted to go back out and reach out to them and uh, so we had the patrol commanders conference and we did uh, training for uh, every one of the state police patrol commanders. Uh, they saw value in it, so they are pushing TIM training back out to all their people uh, to get them to understand. Because you have to remember, you know, 20 police officers were struck and killed last year. You know, the highest responder discipline uh, in the country. So we need to make sure that they get it. Uh, they are a very good partner with us now. Uh, and I told them, when you take the training, you're going to see stuff that you don't like in this training, and I don't care. I'm still going to show it to you. So I showed them some some photos of them doing traffic safety details with every one of the troopers standing in the middle of the roadway without wearing a safety vest. I said, if you're not actually going to take training or safety serious, you know, why are you doing a traffic safety uh, program? So they understood uh, that. So these are some of the numbers. This is where we were in uh, 2016. We were 11.6%. This is where we're at now, 32.8%. So with our pen time program, and it's, and it's not me, and it's not just the turnpike, we're using our MPOs, DVRPC, SPC, uh, Tri-County Planning. We're using our uh, turnpike, PennDOT, Fire Academy, EMS. We're all working together to train, train, to train as many people as possible. We meet quarterly. We have a uh, traffic incident management. Our pen time meeting is next Thursday. If any other states or anybody wants to call in and and be part of that. We have a WebEx available. Feel free to reach out to me. These are some of the numbers that we've done uh, for the year. You know, the lower number is, you know, last year in, in 2019, we taught 137 in-person TIM training classes, training 3,200 uh, responders. The year before, we did 66 classes, training 1,617 responders. So we're constantly making improvements. We're trying to get more people. You know, in Pennsylvania, we have 308 uh, traffic incident management uh, trainers. Uh, probably out of those 308, there may be eight of us that teach classes. So if they're not going to be training, you know, are they trainers anymore? So we're trying to get make, make sure that people have, uh, you know, if we train them, that they're going to go out and teach for us. One of the other things that, that I wanted to, to discuss quickly, and, and we have a copy of this here, is our Pennsylvania Turnpike Field Guide. This helps us with quick quick clearance because our field units now no longer have to call with some basic information that they need to get. They have it right at their fingertips. So we gave these to our state police. We gave these to our maintenance units. And this is a field guide, or, or we call it the PTC 101 field guide. Some of the information it has in there, it has about road closures, has it in about our, our access gates and the responsibilities, and also some contact information. Uh, this is available for, for download here. It's a PTC 101 field guide, and you can see what all is in that field guide as well. Finally, uh, Jim and, and uh, Paul, you know, we wanted to talk about the, the Turnpike's mass casualty incident that we had on January 5th. Many of you, this made national news. Uh, five uh, civilians were killed in this crash. It happened in the remote area of our Pennsylvania Turnpike about uh, 3.40 in the morning. Five fatalities, over 50 injured. You know, that's a, a, uh, a look at the scene there. Uh, a bus overturned. And got hit by three commercial vehicles. It was uh, in my uh, 37 years as an emergency responder. It's probably one of the most horrific uh, incident scenes that we had with the uh, civilian deaths and seeing them there. Uh, again, that's an overhead look of, of the accident. Uh, the bus hit the embankment, went up the embankment, and rolled across the three-lane section of the roadway, and was struck by a UPS truck. Uh, the two drivers of the UPS truck were. Uh, killed 
a five-year-old little girl was killed. Uh, the bus driver was ejected into the eastbound lane as well. Uh, that's just some overhead footage showing the scene early on. Again, this is the one of the most remote sections of the Pennsylvania Turnpike, uh, so it made challenge, a challenge for responders to get there. We need to work together as well. Some of our responsibilities for the Pennsylvania Turnpike is if we have a big incident like this, again, I cover all 552 miles of roadway, so I'll respond out to the scene. Uh, so I arrived on the scene probably about two hours after this incident happened because there was about 100 and 70 miles away from my house and, and worked together with the responders and with the state police to do the investigations. Again, that's three of the people, that's two of the truck drivers and one of the, the female that was on the bus uh, that passed away, unfortunately. Uh, there currently is an NTSB investigation. We're expecting the preliminary invest findings to come out uh, hopefully within the next day or two to find out what happened. Uh, some challenges for the scene was the fact that you had 60 plus uh, victims uh, to transport. The bus also hit the embankment that hard that it uh, uncovered an underground spring. So when it hit that, we now have water flowing through the incident scene the whole time of the incident mixing with the diesel fuel and other fluids on the roadway. So that created some challenges as well. Uh, and, and just tried to get the people out into the hospitals as well. Uh, there's a few more photos of the bus uh, from the NTSB investigation, so we've been working with NTSB on the investigation as well. And just some of the emergency units that were at the scene again. We had responders from uh, Westmoreland, Fayette, Somerset, and Cambria County, and also Allegheny, so five different uh, county dispatch response to the area as well, which made some uh, coordination challenges because they uh, did not have a common uh, frequency to uh, talk to each other, so we tried to patch everybody together. There's my contact information. There's also our Penn Time uh, Facebook page. We will have a Turnpike or a Penn Time website up, uh, probably pentime.org. Expect to have that up and running next week. And uh, I know we're up against time, but if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Todd. Excellent. Um, excellent as as usual. Um, you know, I, you know, I really want to thank everybody. We, you know, for their patience with the technical difficulties today. Um, doesn't usually happen, but um, sometimes it, it does. And um, all the presenters were very good. Um, you know, and we. we uh, I apologize if we gave you too much information, um, and I also apologize that we need to end. It's three o'clock, so we need to. But um, if if there is any questions, you know how to reach me. You know how to reach Jim. Um, Todd is most of you know Todd and Sean as well. So um, we're happy to work with you on anything that you might have identified. But you know, one of the reasons we have these webinars is hopefully you can take one thing and learn something, or or and or. Uh, uh, implemented in your area, so something that you know a best practice that you can take and 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 do it. And you heard a lot today, um, but it, take one or two things and and advance your program. So, thanks very much, everybody. Really um, appreciate you dialing in. Next month will be the fourth uh, Wednesday. Would be the 26th, I believe, of February, and um, we'll uh, we'll get you that information very soon. So, thanks again, and um, on behalf of Jim and I, we'll uh, talk to you all soon. Thanks very much.